Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. My name is Amy Wheeler, and I am your host today. All of our listeners, we would like to thank you for being listeners and offer something very special in the months of June, July, and August of 2024. We will be offering meditations where the community can come together online on Zoom for free, and we're going to offer meditations on the new moon and the full moon of every month. June, July, and August. We will also be offering yoga nidra for certain health conditions such as high blood pressure, and we'll be having a summer solstice celebration together on June 20th, 21st, something in there on International Yoga Day, and we would love for you all to come and join us. So we'll put all of the information in the show notes. It's free, it's our gift to you, and it's a way that we can come together as a community and get to know each other better and enjoy a meditation or a yoga nidra. So we hope to see you there. Something that's really been on my mind and in my heart so often lately is the idea that there is an untapped resource that yoga and yoga therapy need to move into. And it's not just healthcare, but it's health clinics, not just integrative medicine, but community-based yoga that can thrive and survive and make it into part of every American's life. And I'm sure other countries are doing the same. I'm going to have Heather Mason on from the UK talking about how she's bringing it to the national healthcare system over there in another episode. But let's just start with a study from 2016, which this is an old study. This is eight years old. And I hope that Yoga Alliance and Yoga Journal are doing a a new one soon. But let's just look at this one because even the numbers from this one are staggering. So in 2016, in the United States alone, there were 36 million people doing yoga. And that was up 20 million from four years earlier. So that's mind blowing. And when they looked ahead, they said that 34% of Americans would be willing to try yoga in the next 12 months. That's another 80 million people. So what that means, and again, this is back in 2016, that there is a lot of yoga out there. And I know it may seem like it has reached its all time high, but I think it's just beginning. And the reason that it's just beginning is because of the body, mind, breath, and spiritual connection that people are feeling. It's different than any other type of exercise. We are now having the research to support and show the evidence around yoga and yoga therapy and how well they're working for people. So I'd like to share this research article from 2020, a comprehensive review of yoga research. And again, this is a few years old. It's from the beginning of the pandemic, but I think yoga has even expanded since then. So what they looked at in this study is 1,149 citations were taken out of the different databases, such as PubMed, most of you probably know. And of these 1,149, 46 studies met the eligibility criteria and were included. And these were predominantly mental health and neuropsychology, which doesn't surprise me because yoga was originally made for kind of a psychological shift and a spiritual shift. So it's not that it doesn't also have great exercise benefits. I think we've seen plenty of studies that have that, but I think people forget that yoga was the original anxiety medication and it was originally kind of a mental health prescription, you know, going all the way back thousands of years. So some of the other things that they looked at in these studies were about postural balance, migraines, academic performance, anxiety, depression, these types of things. Other studies in this meta-analysis here are cardiorespiratory systems, exercise in capacity regarding cardiac rehab, hypertension, and then also there are some on cognition, health status, autonomic regulation, 
infertility, ulcerative colitis and urinary incontinence, restless leg syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, and metabolic syndrome. So right there, Ooh, these are the studies they're looking at. And they're basically showing the landscape of the various clinical conditions that can be affected by yoga. So I'll put this link in the show notes. It's a comprehensive review of yoga research in 2020. And there's many wonderful authors, too many to say all of their names. But the point is we have the research and I'm not surprised that it's a lot of mental health. And even if you think about the physical health problems that I just listed off, a lot of those are impacted by anxiety, impacted by stress, impacted by the inability to control allostatic load and the things that stress us out and cause us not to sleep or cause us to overeat or cause us to not get the exercise we need. So stress is really main component. And I always tell our students in our program that there's something that yoga therapy is really, really good. Actually, there's two things, but they're very related. One of them is we are excellent at regulating the autonomic nervous system. So number one, when you think of how the autonomic nervous system impacts the digestive system, impacts the cardiovascular system, impacts the immune system, impacts the endocrine system, it's really amazing what you can do by getting people's heart rate variability to be in good measure, by helping them to have better vagal tone. We are the experts at helping people to regulate their nervous system. And the really cool thing is that we have books from a couple of thousands of years ago to tell us how this is done. So it doesn't just have modern significance, but we actually have these ancient texts to back up what we're saying and to tell us what worked to help people reduce their suffering long, long ago, and it still works today. So that's number one. But number two, in addition to being experts at regulating the autonomic nervous system, we are experts at helping people learn how to to breathe and that breathing mechanism then impacts the stress response, impacts the vagus nerve, impacts the allostatic load. So we're experts in teaching people how to breathe, which impacts their nervous system, which then impacts all those other systems. And I don't know of any other health and healing profession that spends, you know, if you look at the whole training together, over 1000 hours learning about how to regulate nervous system and how to help people breathe to regulate their nervous system. So in my mind, this is needed in every major healthcare system in the United States. Someone that helps doctors, nurses, physician assistants have a referral to a stress management program or therapeutic yoga program where people can come into small groups and we call these functional groups that maybe six or eight or 10 people all with the same symptoms. Maybe they all have neurological symptoms or maybe they're all having trouble breathing in a separate group or maybe a separate group again all have low back pain. We can bring people into smaller groups where it's manageable and we can do this online on Zoom or we can do it in person, depending on the clinic and the space that they have. And I'll talk more about the Zoom option in a minute, but basically we can have small functional groups, which is super affordable for these healthcare providers. And if we can get people to have better vagal tone, to breathe better, to reduce stress, to reduce allostatic load, to have a new perspective, to reduce anxiety and depression, it will impact their physical health also. It's a no brainer. And I think we just need to get the word out there that this is available and that there are thousands and thousands of certified yoga therapists who've gone through this thousand hour training or more and that we are ready to go to work in the healthcare hospital systems as well as you know I look at our graduates many of them are getting hired in addiction clinics both inpatient and outpatient so that's a whole nother area that I've been doing some research in also we have a study coming out that has shown excellent results for people that have gone into a 30 and 60 day day addiction clinic and they're having less pain, they're sleeping better, they're feeling happier. There's so many positive things that we saw happen as a result of these yoga programs. So there's no reason that we can't implement this if we can just get to the right people in the hospital systems that are willing to support something like this. And these small functional groups, I feel that they're the key because it is very affordable. We don't have to do one-on-one, although that's always wonderful too, if we can do one-on-one, one yoga therapist to one 
client, even if it's for 15 minutes to teach them some things about stress management and breathing. But the functional group model, we can meet a particular group of people with similar symptoms maybe four times in a month. This is something I'm doing at the University of Minnesota, where we've chosen April as low back and hip pain month because those two things are often connected. And so in April, we'll have four sessions, one hour per week. Right now, we have over 100 people signed up for our very first one at the University of Minnesota Buck End Center. So that tells you that this model is viable. And so what we did is we're charging $59 per household. So everybody in the household can be on Zoom. And the reason that we've chosen Zoom is because oftentimes people who are in a lot of pain, low back and hip pain, it's almost impossible to get out of your house get into a car or bus or some form of transportation, drive over to a clinic, get out of your car, walk in, maybe have to go up some stairs. By the time you even get to the class, you're in so much pain, you can't even stand it. Then go through the class, which hopefully will reduce the pain, but then reverse it and go back home. It's just not reasonable. So by doing it on Zoom, it's cost effective, or it wouldn't have to be Zoom, it could really be any video platform, but it's cost effective and it's better for the clients because they are oftentimes not feeling well. So we feel that this model is very financially viable. We're seeing it work in a big system like University of Minnesota. And so we're having one in April, which is low back and hips. We're gonna do a second one in July, and that's going to be therapeutic yoga for upper back and neck pain. And then in October, we'll do a third one for therapeutic yoga for insomnia and anxiety, because those two things are often related. And again, each one of these series will be four weeks, one hour per week. And we're seeing a great, great result so far. And my hope is that we can expand it even further. If I were to vision out and tell you my real dream, it's to get every healthcare office clinic that is affiliated with the University of Minnesota told about these classes so that all of their people can start attending too. That would be a wonderful way to have almost like a regional center where one teacher can be on Zoom and we can have people from all over Minnesota come and be together. And if you kept the groups 10 people and under, there's a lot of personal interaction that can happen and a lot of community that can be built. So, you know, there's something to be said for that too, the healing of being in community. So we could go that way or we could go more like a webinar. And this is what we're starting with at the University of Minnesota, where people are kind of responsible for their own bodies because the teacher could not possibly watch 100 people on Zoom all at the same time. So, you know, depending on what your hospital or your clinic or your facility wanted, you could go either way. Now, some of the addiction clinics that our graduates are working in, they are doing in-person functional groups where it's maybe a teacher, one teacher to every 15 clients. That could be a way to do it. They also are offering in some of these addiction clinics one-on-one. -on -one. So you get a one-on-one -on -one lesson, say twice a week, or maybe you do a one-on-one -on -one lesson once a week and then a group lesson twice a week. So there's many, many ways to structure it, but I think it's a really great model. And I'm starting to see that there are many hospitals out there that are starting to talk about this and to consider it. So what I just did is I went on the website for the IAYT. It's the public facing website of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And the web address is www.yogatherapy, all one word, dot health. And I looked up the clinical settings that they've listed here, like who's already doing things like this. And it says many hospitals and standalone clinics are now offering gentle group and individual yoga sessions. They include mindfulness, other types of meditation, individual yoga therapy sessions, and small group classes. Therapeutic yoga may be a part of clinical care for specific health conditions, such as type 2 diabetes, chronic pain, headaches, and more. It may also be used to help patients and providers cultivate personal stress management practices. And I've always said this, the health education departments of people like Kaiser Permanente 
they should be all over this. I have a friend and colleague, Colleen Carroll, who was one of the first people in Kaiser Permanente to set up a yoga therapy clinic and with great, great success. So let's go ahead and look at some of these. So in some of the hospitals, we've got Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center, Cleveland Clinic, University of Irvine Medical Center, Duke Integrative Medicine, Geisinger Medical Center, Center, Howard County General Hospital, Innova, Mayo Clinic Health Systems, Mount Sinai's Health System, Northwest Health, Beaumont Health, and then University Hospitals, Connor Integrative Health Network. So those are kind of the general therapeutic yoga classes with an emphasis on stress management. But if you continue onward, now we've got ones that are specializing in yoga and yoga therapy for cancer care. So now we're looking at memorial Memorial Sloan Ketterling Cancer Center, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Ottawa Integrative Cancer Center, Simon Cancer Center, University of Maryland, and Hillman Cancer Center. So that's just for cancer. Then we've got some that are doing mental health. And this list is not exhaustive because I know five more that should be on this mental health list, but the ones they have listed on the website are Chicago Behavioral Hospital and Venice Family Clinic. And then we've got military settings like the VH Whole Health Initiative. Initiative, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, the UK National Health Services, which I'll talk more about that in another episode with Heather Mason. And then there's in Sweden, the hospitals are just blooming with therapeutic yoga. It's really part of how they operate now. And I also want to include all of these hospitals in India that have been doing this for 50 to 100 years. It's pretty amazing that this has already been happening in India for so long and shown to be very successful. So number one, we've got the research to support it. Number two, we've got models out there of places that it's working. Number three, I always say the next pandemic is our mental health pandemic, meaning everything that happened with COVID-19 is now leading us to a place where many people have mental health issues right now. And so what is something that needs to be brought to the table, not just for nervous system regulation, not just for breathing, but mental health. And so another thing that I want you to think about, you know, for 25 years, I worked at California State University as a professor, and I brought therapeutic yoga into all of my yoga classes that I taught there. I taught tens of thousands of students over the years, and it was amazing to see how much these kids benefited. So, you know, I would have nursing students that took the class every single semester because it gave them better grades. They were able to manage their stress and do better in nursing school. So you've got a ton of kids in college that could also benefit from therapeutic yoga, not just group yoga for exercise. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love that too. And I think most college kids really love kind of an exercise type of yoga. And I think there's so much of that offered in, in yoga studios or a gym or 24 hour fitness. I love that it's so widely available, but I think college kids and even high school kids need therapeutic yoga, which is quite different. Again, it's almost like the kids in the classroom are a functional group. And I have a very special way that I kind of measure where they are with their mental health before class and after class to see how it changed. And I've actually done some research studies on this also. So, and that is that we have this model where they can check in, you know, on the model. And we actually have a mobile app called the Optimal State Mobile App. It's for iPhone and for Android. And they check in before class in a, several different measures. You can do it on the app now. But at that time, I was just had pieces of paper with these charts and they would circle things and tell me where they were before class. Then we'd spend about an hour together. And at the end of class, they would also check off how they were feeling in mental health related measures. And I cannot tell you how much it changed these kids' lives, but maybe less importantly, I should say, it was statistically significant every single quarter, time after time after time when we ran this data. It was pretty amazing. I would see the kids on campus and they would yell my name, you know, from across campus. It was so adorable and be like, Dr. Wheeler, I'm having a great day. And so that's a whole nother area of education that therapeutic yoga. And I personally think we need to go all 
the way back to kindergarten and start teaching small children breathing techniques, nervous system regulation, all the way from the very beginning. Let's get out there and change the world with therapeutic yoga. And again, yoga for exercise is one thing and it's wonderful. But what I'm talking about is someone that knows and has been trained for a thousand hours or more on how to use breath techniques to impact the nervous system, how to use certain meditations to impact the nervous system. And we might also do some postures because movement is great. But I think a lot of 200 hour yoga teachers have been trained mainly in the postures. By the time you go through a thousand hours of training, you know how to modify those postures. You know how to teach them sitting in a chair. Again, you know how to do all sorts of different breath work and meditations. There's just a whole nother skill set that many people who teach therapeutic yoga have. And so I would like to kind of have a call to action that all of us in the field of yoga therapy and therapeutic yoga, we collectively put our minds towards what I'm talking about today that we each go to our local school, we each go to our local hospital or healthcare clinic and show them what we're capable of doing. And by showing them, I mean, go and offer a class to the teachers, to the administrators, to the parents and let them feel it and then follow up with some great research that is specific to that population. The research is out there. So go on PubMed, type in your keywords and download some really great great peer-reviewed research to show the effects on the nervous system, to show the effects of all those different things that the 2020 study that I talked about at the beginning of this episode, and start educating your community and getting your foot in the door. You don't have to teach for free for you know six months or anything, but you need to go out there and let people know who you are, what you can do, how you can be of service to them, and show them a functional business model that has I think to do with small functional groups. And that again can be in person or it can be online. And if you're a doctor, if you're a hospital administrator, if you're a psychologist that's listening right now, go out and try to find someone in your area that could work with you. They're on this yoga therapy site that I was showing you, yogatherapy.health. Again, that's the public facing website of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. There's a way to put in your zip code and find all the practitioners near you. So I think we as a community can get out there if we put our minds to it and change the world, frankly. There is not one person that doesn't need this. And, you know, some might say, I don't know if I can bring yoga into my healthcare setting or my public school or whatever it is. You know, it can be secular. It really can be secular. One of the things our teacher taught us from India, his name was TKV Deskachar, is that we can adapt the practice to the people in front of us. And if we need to adapt it to be secular because that's what's best for that client, we can do that. So that's the other thing. I think a lot of people get a little scared off about yoga and what are the you know implications of us having yoga. And I don't want to erase the roots of India. I don't want to take away that it comes from South Asia. And again, in a therapeutic context, we can meet the person in front of us where they are. You know, that's just part of whole person healthcare that we're going to get to know the person in front of us, get to know their values, understand their beliefs and meet them where they are, meet them in a place using language that they can understand and language that's comfortable for them. And to say, how can I help you? Okay, you have anxiety or you have depression or you have trouble breathing or you're having, you know, POTS, you know, a nervous system disorder, or you're having autoimmune disease issues. Let me show you how to use your own body to feel better more often and keep it simple. You know, when I would ask the college kids, which was a very secular setting, it was a public university, and I would ask them at the end of the semester, they'd write a paper about all the different ways that they had changed. I made them write a paragraph on how their physical body had changed, if it had, then how their breathing had changed, how their mental states had changed, how their personality had changed, their relationships, and then, you know, if they had any change in their emotions. I probably still have them 
stacks and stacks of papers of kids saying how they changed in all of those areas. And it is just heartwarming to think. And even now on LinkedIn, almost every day I get, after 25 years of being a college professor, you can imagine, almost every day I get a note from one of the students that I taught over those 25 years saying, yoga changed my life. It set me on a different trajectory. You know, they still email me. It's really actually quite heartwarming to see what yoga was able to do for these people who probably signed up for a yoga class, not realizing what was about to happen to them and that it could be therapeutic and it could change their life and that they could use their own breathing to manage their anxiety or their insomnia. One more thing that I'm just thinking about for 25 years, I've worked with college male golfers. And so I've been doing that since, oh my gosh, the late nineties. And I still do it today. I work with a division one team and they just call me up each session that I do individually with these kids is a half an hour, one-on-one it's on the phone. We don't even get on zoom. They're usually walking across campus or sitting in their car. And we just talk through how to manage their anxiety, how to get better sleep, how to communicate their needs to the coach, how to use breathing techniques before they're going to putt or tee off. And so that's a whole nother area that I think schools and education could also think about that if you've got a properly trained therapeutic yoga teacher, they could be used for all the sports teams also. Other ideas around that, every year we have team meetings where we focus on sports psychology as a group to kind of lay out the basics before we break off into the one-on-one work. So I feel very hopeful for the future of therapeutic yoga, whether it be in education or healthcare or psychology. And I feel like people are waiting around for something to happen. And, you know, if you look at the latest jobs report from the International Association of Yoga Therapists, it's no different than the jobs report seven years earlier, sadly. I was heartbroken to see that in seven years, we haven't really made any more progress. And I think that yoga therapy is a fairly new field and therapeutic yoga is a fairly new field and that everybody's sitting around thinking somebody else is going to do something. And so this is your call to action. You are the person that you're waiting for. You have to get out there and make connections. You have to get out there and give people an experience of having a well-balanced, regulated nervous system. You have to show up with the research in hand and educate people and say, hey, here's what we can do for you. So that is our challenge as a community. And if you're listening to this as a hospital administrator or you know someone who has the ability to influence decisions, call me, <laughs> call me, get a hold of me and we will find the right person to work with you and for you and figure out how we can get this in more healthcare systems. So thank you everyone for listening today. It's been my pleasure to be with you. I look forward to connecting with you in the future and get out there and and spread the word so that we can change the world. All right, everyone, have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Yoga Therapy Hour. You can also see the video versions on YouTube. If you'd like to get early release, you can always support us as a Patreon member. If you'd like to find us on YouTube or Patreon, just type in the Yoga Therapy Hour and Optimal State and you'll find us. All right, thank you for your support. We appreciate you so much. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria and Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.